Translation with Bobby Martin. I'm Sam Perkins, coming to you from the WCTV studios in Wilmington, Massachusetts. We are joined today by a former professional basketball player, a kind of small town kid who, who went pretty far in the sport uh, before some unexpected things ended his career. Now he's helping the next generation, uh, Mike St. John. Mike, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me, man. Pleasure to be here. Appreciate you, appreciate you being here, my man. Thank you. So uh, I, I guess to start off, because you've been, you've been all around the world, uh, where are some places that you've played overseas? Um, so I started out, I was in Poland my first year out, first year out of, out of the U.S., so that was a interesting. Um, and then I ended in Japan, so it kind of spanned all over the place. But in the middle, throughout the middle part of the career, it was all over Eastern Europe for the most part. Uh, Scandinavia, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, and then I played in the Euro uh, Euro Cup. So like we were traveling internationally to different spots. Um, I think I did it one time, like right after retiring. I, I had to get a new passport because so, uh, my other one was full. So I think I was in like twenty something different countries. What either playing like domestically or traveling to play against mm-hmm. the team. So um, filled up the passport pretty good. Now it's uh, back to the States. Not, not as much traveling anymore. Uh, I guess, you know, because you're from an area that I knew nothing about growing up, uh, growing up in, in Cambridge in the greater Boston area. Um, you're from Northboro. Mm-hmm. But I got to know really well, moved out that way for, for work, for my wife's work, and, and really, really developed an affinity for the area. Um, but it's... it's it's like a, a small town. It's outside of Worcester, which is a big city, mm-hmm. um, but it's it's definitely different. Um, and before you, I mean, certainly, I don't think a lot of Hoopers are professional athletes coming from Northboro, Division One athletes. But you're starting to, you know, put help a lot of kids from that area kind of get on the map. It seems like there's been a lot more since you. Um, but tell me, what was it like growing up there? What what was Northboro like? Um. Yeah, I mean, it's a smaller town. Not like, you know, it's not like 2,000 people small, but I think it's like 15,000, something like that. Yeah. We were like 10, 10 minutes, 15 minutes from Worcester. I had a lot of family there, so it wasn't like we yeah. were isolated in like the back rural woods, but uh, it was all right. You know, we, we the good thing about where we were is centrally located, so from a sports standpoint, we would play everywhere. Like when I played Pop Warner football, we were all up 495. We'd play Lowell, Methuen, Bill Ricca, all those teams, uh, Chelmsford. Um, and then in baseball, same thing. We travel all over the place. Basketball, we play in Worcester a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, Framingham. Framingham's like not technically a city, but it's like yeah. 100,000 people. You get uh, some good players out of there. Um, but. As far as just growing up there, it was different. It's different now, like, being a coach and seeing the resources these kids have and, like, knowing who everybody is. When I was younger, like, you either read about the person in the paper or you played against them. Other than that, you never saw them. So it was, like, (laughs) more, like, um, word of mouth hearing about a name. Oh, so-and-so is really good. Like, I remember when I was in high school, uh, Lewis Ford from Cambridge. Yeah, Lou, that's my guy. You know what I mean? Like, I never played against them or saw him play, just read about him in the paper as being one of, you know, so that's kind of... Now these kids are doing their open runs. They play against everybody in the mm-hmm. state, which is good to a degree, but it's like it's kind of funny. It's more like the, everybody's friends with everybody, which isn't a bad thing. If you, But for me, it was like I didn't want to be friends with, with those kind of guys. I wanted to compete against them. I wanted to be able to be like, I'm, I'm better. You know, humbly, of course, yeah. but like it was a challenge that I wanted. I didn't want to play with them, you know. Um, but sorry, back to your original question. Uh I mean, it was good. For me, I played three sports. It was just the norm. All my friends, we grew up playing sports together. Everybody was relatively close. You could either walk to their house, ride your bike to their house. Um, Just kind of, you know, I have a really good tight-knit group of friends. I'm still friends with them, like probably 10 guys I grew up with since I was like five years old. Um, And we're really close still. Uh, So, I mean, I really enjoyed growing up there. Um, Like I said, I was close enough to other things to where... I wasn't sheltered and isolated. My dad grew up in New London, Connecticut, so like, you know, I wasn't a sheltered kid. Being, you know, that's the yeah. that's the uh, what's the word? The stigma of being a suburban kid. Yeah. Like, you're not worldly and you don't know what's going on. So, uh, but no, I, I enjoyed my time growing up there. You know, I still live there now. So, 
was basketball always kind of your 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 sport? Because I know you played football, you played baseball as a kid. I think you played baseball in high school some too. Mm-hmm. Was it always bat? The basketball always? Was no, it was actually basketball? the opposite. Uh, like I said, three sports, but it was more like whatever season you're in is your sport. Mm-hmm. But for me, baseball was my primary sport. Like I played that year round. That was my primary focus. I always dreamed of playing in the major leagues. Um, basketball, I just liked doing it. Uh, and when I was in season, I did it, but I didn't train. Like I didn't play AAU, I didn't have a trainer, I didn't do any of that stuff. I did, have, I did it with baseball. Um, and then I got to, when I got older, uh, my, what was I, like 17 or 18, I hurt my shoulder and it never healed right. And so I had to have a fallback plan. I was actually more recruited for baseball at one point um, than basketball. And uh, I had some scouts looking at me from the, you know, the the Mets and the Rockies yeah. were looking at me. I played Legion. I played AAU baseball. I was going to do Stan Musial. Like, I went to a bunch of different showcases down in Miami, University of Miami. I did all that stuff. Um, so that was my goal. And did then you pitch? Yeah, I was a pitcher. Okay. So... Uh, <laughs> I won't get into it because it's for another day, but I had an issue at the school I was at where I shouldn't have pitched uh, because I did some exercises the night before and that basically weakens all your interior muscles. And we had a scrimmage and the coach was like, you got to pitch. And it was a whole back and forth over, I shouldn't, but I'm a kid, I was a kid. I should have said, no, absolutely not. I'm not doing anything. I kind of let him basically kind of talk me into it and I did it and that basically wrecked my shoulder. So I had surgery wow. and it never... It never healed right. So then I was like, well, I need to get a scholarship somehow. I was good at basketball. Wasn't my primary sport, but I was always, like, made the all-star team, like Metro West all-star, all that stuff. And when I transferred to prep school, um, you know, I was, like, all ISL and all that stuff. And, you know, had success there, but it just still wasn't my focus. So I went to a showcase down in uh, um, New Jersey, which was Eastern Invitational at the time. Now it's Hoop Group, essentially. It's the same thing. And I, I did really well there. I made their top 20 team, which is like the top all-star yep. game in front of the whole camp. I ended up having all my offers from that one weekend. Uh, you know, I played one season of AAU basketball. It was probably the funnest I've, funnest time in my life from a basketball standpoint. We had a bunch of, like, kids. Everybody went on to play college, pretty much all D3 kids. It was me. I, I was the only Division One player. Um, and then one kid played Division Two at Stonehill. Um but I had two kids went on to Williams and won the D3 National yep. Championship. Just, like, solid, solid teams. We ended up being, like, second in the state. But it was just really fun. Like, our coach was a great guy. Not a huge X's and O's guy. More like roll the ball out. <laughs> yeah, roll like, it out. Like, horns, high ball set, you know. <laughs> like high ball screen action. It was yeah. very simple. But it was, it was, it was great. Um, so that was, like, kind of the extent of it, uh, of my basketball. You know, I wasn't on the circuit. I wasn't, like, nationally yeah. well-known, you know. I was, I would say, if I'm honest, I was good from, like, I had a good motor, I was strong, and I was athletic, but I wasn't, like, unbelievably skilled because it wasn't my focus, you know? Um, I kind of was behind the eight ball a little bit to when I got to college. I had to be, oh, this is, like, I got to pick it up a little bit. Like, you could get by with being athletic and having a motor, but I had to work on some stuff. Um, and so, um, but, yeah, that was... That was kind of for me when when the baseball thing ended was was tough, but fortunately for me it was like okay well, I'm I'm good enough at something else where I can get a scholarship. I mean I was six eight and athletic in basketball yeah that 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 gets you somewhere, but six eight and athletic as a pitcher in baseball that's that's that you know big is big in general I mean you're huge for for a human being but in basketball you're like kind of yeah yeah he's power forward that's power forward size in baseball on the mound it's like wow that dude's. Huge. Yeah, it's like, Randy Johnson. Yeah, ain't I, t- I tell that to people all the time when they're, you know, people are always like, oh, six, eight, eight. and I always say like, you know, in my world as a basketball yeah. world, like I'm not that tall, like, like we're the same size yeah. pretty much. <laughs> it's not a big deal. I'm used to seeing people that I'm looking up to, so um, it is funny. But yeah, as a pitcher, you definitely be in the in the higher percentages. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think Thank there's you, a man. few six ten guys like Randy. Randy Johnson was yeah. six ten. There's a few more six eight guys now, but. It, it is a big advantage, man, from, as a hitter. From, I played at a pretty high level. The the release point between, you know, a 6'2", 6'3", pitcher and a 6'8", pitcher, just how much less reaction time you have, whether it's a fastball. Oh, the or angle at which it's yeah. coming down, it's too. Crazy. It's coming down it's, yeah, at, it's at an angle. I mean, how hard was it 
when you kind of realize like you know I can't my body's just not the same and if baseball was your thing how hard was it to I know you see how to come up with a backup plan at plan B but how hard was it to accept that and kind of move on to the next I mean it was it was really hard you know uh, it's what I dreamed of you know my dad shout out to my dad was always my biggest he's like my hero still uh, he was always there for me we were down at the field. I lived right next to the baseball field in Northboro, so I could literally walk across the street. It was right there. Uh, like four or five hours a day, no exaggeration. My dad was a house painter by trade, so he'd be out all day painting houses, come down and catch for me or hit fly balls or ground balls to me, whatever. So that was like a lot of, we put in a lot of like sweat and, you know, all that stuff. Yeah. Um, it, it was devastating to him too. Uh, but for me, it was just... I think it was, I think it was, uh, it's been so long now, it's almost like 20 years or so, but for a long time it bothered me a lot, uh, especially because it impacted a lot of stuff, like it's still, I still feel it sometimes, Yeah. and I can still throw, but not to the degree, um, it was just an adjustment, it took a long time, fortunately, like, because basketball flowed right into it, I couldn't like dwell on it as long. It wasn't until like after like to, to this day, I don't even watch baseball like that anymore. I used to watch it all day. Any game that was on TV, like I said, I lived across the street. Yeah, I'd go over and watch all like Babe Ruth leagues or yeah. Legion games or whoever was playing. I would just sit there and watch for like hours and, and whatever. Maybe my friends were there, I'd play catch with them or just hang out. Um, yeah, and I just stopped doing that. And then basketball, once you go to the Division One level, or really any level uh, of college, 3, 2, or 1, it's like a job. But at the Division One level, it's like full-time job. So, like, I didn't really have a ton of time to be, like, to dwell on it. It was like, okay, now this is something different. This is a year-round right. thing. I got to really get it going. Um, so that, I guess, probably helped me. But, you know, I still think about it. Yeah. Like, like it would have made my life easier. You don't have to be in the same kind of shape. Yeah. As a baseball player, yeah. as a pitcher too, you yeah. you pitch like every fifth day or yeah. fifth game. You don't have to be in year round like cardiovascular shape. And yeah. for me, I was always like, probably to a fault mentally, I was always like had to be in peak shape, which probably was detrimental. Like you can't be in mm-hmm. peak shape year round. You got to like build up. Yeah. With baseball, you didn't have to worry about that. You know. So, um, but yeah, just an adjustment and. Yeah, it still bums me out, but it is what it is. You know, things worked out pretty well. Um, can't change it. So. I'm still still annoyed with that guy, though, the yeah, coach. I bet. I that way. Be, I, if I saw him, there'd be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> so Bobby and I, it's, it's fun. you know, we talked a lot about, in our AAU episode, we were talking about coaching and, and, and what we see as, you know, there's some great, great coaches out there, great people. You now, and we'll get into coaching, are, are one of them. Uh, but so many coaches that coach for all the wrong reasons or doing it for whatever, to vicariously the live through the, yeah. the stuff that they, they didn't have themselves or because they're in their minds they make it seem like they're coaching in the, you know, like the NBA Finals or the seventh great game of the World Series. But I, I've noticed that at the, at the high school level, at the AAU level, when you're getting into like, you know, kids that are, you know, you have to train, you, you're at a certain level, that there is just a lack of, I think, I think awareness or, or concern for the long-term well-being of players. Like, I can't – I'm sure we all know players that were high school that were good whose bodies were they, – they just blew something out, suffered some sort of catastrophic injury that was probably from from being overworked or from a coach not looking out for them, being like, hey, like, you know, yeah, I know this game's important, but it's more important you get your you get over this injury so that you can have a lot more – important games on bigger stages down the road like just the number of, of high school and AAU coaches that just kind of use kids up while they've got them instead mm-hmm. of putting them in a position to be the best they can be at the next level yeah I mean you definitely see that um, I think the thing that bothers me a lot is like I, I consider myself a purist you know what I mean yeah. where it's like you know I have an AAU program myself but and of course, when you have a business, it's you're, you're trying to make money, of course, but it's like, to what degree? Mm-hmm. I feel like what happens a lot now is the AAU landscape is so saturated with like pop-up programs here and there, and all they do is just want to yeah. pump money in. Like, they look at kids like dollar signs. And I've, 
I, I know people pretty well that that's how they talk. They'd be like, hey, the, the, the check clears, and that's all they care about. And that that's what bothers me. It's like, obviously, yeah, you, you're trying to run a business, but you're also, like, you have a responsibility. And um, to me, it's like the development of the kid, the player, is, is the most important thing. Like, if you do a good job as a coach or a trainer or whatever, all the rest of that stuff will come with it. You know what I mean? But you got to get the players to, you know, in, uh, buy in to what you're trying to do. And a lot of a lot of people just, they're great marketers and all yeah. they care is, is just churning it out. Doesn't matter. New wave of kids, you know what I mean? Unless you're at the, the shoe programs yeah. where you're sponsored and that's a little different, that's a different animal. But your mid-tier AAU programs, mid to lower tier, a lot of it is just money makers, man. That's why you get it, you have a lot of teams that are not really competitive and they have 15 kids on a team, but they produce a lot of money and it's like, it's not really a good, in my opinion, not not a good thing. So I think I've seen uh, previous episodes with you guys where you talk about it where I think you even mentioned that it's oversaturated, you know? Yeah. There's, when I, I played one year of AAU, like I mentioned, right? But it was, like, exclusive. If you played AAU, it meant you were a pretty good player. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're around like, the same age. That's yeah. what it was like when, when there I... There was maybe 10 teams in the whole state. Yeah. We had to go all over the place, Rhode Island, all, all, mm-hmm. all the time to play in these tournaments. Um, now it's just a matter of can you pay? Now for me, like as a director, and I and I've been a director of a few programs. Um, I want there to be there should be like a distinct difference between your rec level, yeah. your travel level, and your AAU level. Yeah. Those three tiers. And the problem is, a lot of players are rec level, but they're playing in AAU. Yeah. And. That's okay if there's not if you don't have a lot of resources. Maybe like the certain season, there's no rec season. So I don't want to be like, okay, we should cancel it all out. But there should be tiers. Like a lot of times is maybe you're a lower level, like a D level, or if you're giving letters to it, A, yeah. B, C, D. Maybe a D level team, C level team. But the tournament has nothing even close to that. They're just an A level or a B level. Yeah. So the talent gap is so strong, you're not benefiting from it. So I don't know what the right answer is, but there should be, like, there's got to be more of a distinction between what AAU is. No, it's not even AAU anymore because the Amateur Athletic Union doesn't even run it. It's just grassroots basketball, if you want to call it that. Grassroots basketball, club basketball. Um, There just needs to be a distinction because a lot of people, they sign up and, like, or they go to tryouts and they've maybe never played before. They're just, it's probably not what you should be getting into. You know, and then for me, like I said, as a director, when I when that happens, and I, you try to warn the parents, like, listen, the expectation's a little higher, the intensity level is much higher, like, this is what you're getting into, type of thing. Um, but yeah, I think you know, just to sum it up, it's just it's an oversaturation. Like the product has gone down, um, or the quality, I should say, has gone down. But at the same time, it's like, you know, it's an argument to where, like, well, there should be resources for players to have. So uh, it's got to be a balance there. Um, so is it a, what do you think about dividing the groups up? I think they try to do it in AAU um, where, you know, you, you've got, a, 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 I'm sorry, gold bracket, yeah. silver bracket. I mean, when you get into too many colors of the rainbow, I mean, at that, at that point, you know, you're probably not that good. Okay? I, yeah. So... How should there be another level of AAU, or is that is that local is that local basketball? Is that travel basketball? What is that? I mean, that's a great question. I mean, that's kind of what I'm say- I'm saying. Like, I don't really know what would be the best answer, but it's we talked about. I had talked about it. Uh, I think on our AAU episode that like you want there to be somewhere that if a kid is passionate about the sport, you know, you want it to be there to be somewhere that that every kid can play, especially when they're younger because kids mature at such different levels that you'll have a kid that when they're 12 or 13, they haven't had puberty yet, and so they're just not very good. They're not good Mm -hmm. enough to compete, but they're really passionate. And who knows, when they're 17, 18, they might have this crazy growth spurt or development, and if they haven't been able to play their sport for five years because there's nothing available to them, you're going to have this kid who is a talent and hasn't gotten the development all this time. But on the flip side, like... You know, I've 
I've made no, I've, uh, you know, I haven't made my feelings hidden that it is such a money grab for so many. I'm not saying every program, yeah. but so many programs are just like, let's just, whoever we can get to fill out this roster, you know, let's get them uh, so that, you know, we can, we can just maximize the amount of money. And I get it. They're private businesses. They need to make money to, to stay in operation. But there's a, there's a fine so, line. You so so is, it, is it a lack of insight by the parents? Because if your kid's not good enough, the kid shouldn't be playing. So now you're dealing with, you've got to deal with a coach who is, I mean, look, it, it's a business, yeah. right? You use a business. And, you know, he wants a return on investment. You know, at a time. So, do you keep that kid? That kid doesn't play, and you know, you're always dealing with you know parents at the end of the bench, or you know, how, how do you? Uh, I, I mean, I it's know. why I don't coach. <laughs> when I when I so when I I played AAU, me and Mike were on the same, you know, and it was when I was in in middle school, high school, it was it was selective. It was you know, you had to be pretty elite, whether it was yeah. baseball or basketball, to play, and. Um, then I got away from the scene. I wasn't doing it, you know, uh, when I was an athlete, I played in college, but after college. And like several years later, I was teaching, and you know, it had been probably about 10 years almost since I had been involved in AU since I had played. I hadn't followed it or anything. Mm -hmm. And I was coaching high school baseball, and this, someone that I knew was running an AAU program, and they were like, hey, we need some coaches. Like, okay. And it was nothing like what I remembered. I remembered it being elite. I thought I was going to coach at a certain level. Yeah. And it wasn't at all. And it's developmental. If your AAU program is a developmental program, I feel like there needs to be more infrastructure and specific tournaments and stuff geared towards yeah. developmental AAU programs. So you get them on a little bit of a different track, especially with the younger kids, where it's like it's about enjoying the game, loving the game. Now you just throw everybody's just thrown into these same tournaments. And it's like other than, you know, the sneaker circuits. Yeah. And it's just like you have you'll have teams that are so overmatched and um, but I just remember being there and being like, this is totally a money grab. Like, some of the kids that are on this r roster, like, we had a really big roster, an unnecessarily big roster. And I'm yeah, like, 15 kids. Yeah. I mean, and, right. and at baseball, I think it was like 18, 20 kids that were on this roster. And I'm like, one, they all want to play. The difference in talent level between some of the kids just on my roster is massive. And like, some of these kids just, it, like, what is the identity that you want of this team? Is it you want it to be a competitive team playing at the competitive level, or do you want it to be a developmental team? Mm -hmm. You can't have both on one roster. And it was just clear that it was, like, a money grab. And I was, like, after, like, two seasons, one season of that, I was, like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not doing it. I'm just going to stick to coaching high school. Well, I think when you start out, when you're starting out as a program, like, you have to – you have to start with some teams. Yeah. You know, if you're looking for like four five star kids, like your first time yeah, it's out, not gonna happen. it's going to take a while yeah. to build it up. So, like, yeah, you, you might have to be a little more flexible with things, you know? And ideally, ideally, you kind of want tiers, you know what I mean? Yeah. You want to have like, for let's say a certain age group, you want to have a few teams that you can, so that way you can place them accordingly. That's like the goal of like any director or, or coach. You want your team to have the best chance to be successful. Obviously, there's, okay, do I want to challenge my team? My team thinks they're really good, so maybe they need to be humbled mm -hmm. or whatever. Right. But you don't want to be, you don't want, uh, like if you're, again, back to the letters, but a C team playing against an A team, just get pounded by 40 and not get anything out of it. Yeah, like, you don't want it to be a whole season of that. Exactly. You know? um, but again, you want to have, you want to have options. If you have a seventh grade team, let's just say, for example, maybe you have two of them. Yep. And you have like more of an elite team, quote unquote, and then maybe you have a, a lower tier team. But there's opportunities for both. Because if you try to combine it, what happens is sometimes the less talented players get overwhelmed, and then the more talented are kind of, they're maybe held back a little bit yeah. because they're not. I wish there was more of a, like a referral program. And I feel like some coaches because i don't speak in absolutes and there are some really good dudes look we have you in here you're a really good dude i appreciate so i'm not it. here like you know aau coaches are scumbags like all of them no not at all but i'm just saying i wish there was more of a like a, almost like a referral program where like if you're say running a more of an elite program more of an a-level program yeah and there's a kid that, that you know that comes and tries out you know He's a great kid, loves the game, works hard. You're like, wow, that kid would be great for more of a developmental level program. 
like I could have him on my roster as like the twelfth guy, and he's not really gonna play, yeah. and not get much. Or like I know this other person who's running this program that's more at his level. Let me refer him to there. And but I feel like a lot of coaches are much more in the like I want every last dollar and cent. So even though this kid isn't at the level of my program, he's willing to keep showing up so I can cash that check from his family. So I'm gonna have him here instead. And I wish there was a little bit more of that going on. Of like, or this kid is like, look, he's a great, great kid, and we could be like, hey, you can play some games with us if you want. But really, like. We're a developmental program. I know you're in our community. Maybe you don't know anything else, but you're like four levels above what our yeah. team is. Let me recommend you to a bigger program. Like I just, I feel like there isn't as much of that between programs. So. No, I agree. I mean, I think for me, just in general, like how I conduct myself in general, whether it's business or, I just like to be honest. So I'd rather be honest, sometimes brutally honest, or sometimes like you're talking yeah. about. You'd be better off going here. I think that, you know, for whatever reason, maybe we're not going to challenge you enough or maybe you might be in over your head and this would be a little bit better pace for you, whatever. But a lot of people, it's more like, you know, um, like you said, it's just that's a dollar sign. So you're going to be losing X amount of dollars if you do that. Or it's like you don't want to help any other programs. out, You know, because the AAU world is cutthroat and there's a lot of, I should say, like, unethical people in it. I would definitely um, agree with that. Assessment. And so it's like you people walk around with their guard up a lot of times because so many play, people try to poach players. Um, you know, like you see guys, you see grown men trying to like recruit 12, 13-year-old kids. It's like, listen, I'm not boosting a kid's ego that bad to be like texting him all the time or <laughs> talking to his parents. I always lay it out there, hey, if you want, you know, if you want an opportunity, da, 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 X, Y, and Z. And if they go for it, they go for it. And you, if they're on another team, I don't even talk to them. If they're playing with another team, I don't say a word. I'll ask, like, you play AU, and they'll say, yeah, for who? X, Y, and Z? Okay, cool. Like, I, I don't poach yeah, players. Poach I don't badmouth other programs. Like, I might think a certain way, but I'm not right. saying it to a kid. Right. Um, I just I, I've seen that happen so much, uh, and that that's what drives me nuts. And then they act like they're they're cool with you to your face, yeah. dap you up at tournaments. Oh, what's good? Blah 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 blah. Like, how's everything going? But I know you talked to three of my guys yesterday. Like, so, so, you know, one of the problems, and just knowing your background and your history, you know, the one of the problems with AU basketball, you mentioned not speaking, you know, to the kids. Mm -hmm. You have so much wisdom to share with the kid that another coach is afraid of what you could possibly share. They don't even know you that well. Yeah. But you just being able to impart some wisdom on a kid would help the kid tremendously, right? Look, this is where I've been, this is where I've done. And you've got coaches that, I mean, I'm just saying, you've got more evaluated experience. Uh -huh. that's, what I'm, that's what I'm saying. So I find myself doing that sometimes. I'm like, all right, well, I remember when I first started getting into AAU basketball and trying to help up, I'm like, I'm saying to myself, why the hell would I not say something? You know, yeah. so you know, to me, it, it doesn't make sense not to n not to speak to the kid. I'm, I, and, and this is a challenge. You should, because I, I I got your history. You yeah. should really talk to these kids because if we don't, no one will. Yeah. You know, let let the coaches deal with that. You know. Yeah. I mean, seriously, they they need they they need help. They need guidance. You know, and then well, wherever you can get it from, you should get it. I think, getting back to your original point, where I think you mentioned couple minutes ago about like is it the parents that don't know any better type of thing mm -hmm. like I think that plays a big role in it I think it's twofold and 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 don't get me wrong like I love the parents but some of them are unrealistic yeah they they think their kid is a certain level and they're really not and and like again like you said there's, there's somewhat of an expertise like I would consider myself like an expert like as playing and coaching like I've been in it for a long time yeah. you deserve so, to be hurt <laughs> so my evaluation of talent is pretty good yeah. have I been wrong before 1000% mm -hmm. I'll be the first one to admit it I right. tell that to players all the time do I make mistakes made a, made many but I try not to make the same ones over and over I'm not saying my word is law but like if I was to be like you know so and so is a little bit behind yeah whatever it's almost like it's like a personal thing. It's like it's not personal. I'm just trying to be honest yeah. with you. I mean, like, mm -hmm. there's a difference between you saying, you know, this kid. I think he would really use some development, or hey, this kid really could go somewhere in hoops if he 
does everything right and it really makes it a you know a priority or in a passion yeah. versus like every tournament it doesn't matter what level it could be the lowest level or obviously sneaker tournaments but like you can go to a, and what age fourth graders fifth graders eighth graders there's always parents and like some sort of a handler yeah. doesn't matter the level that's there like hey this kid's gonna be d1 this kid's gonna be d1 yeah. Yeah, you can tell that on a fifth, a fifth grader who hasn't even hit puberty yet. Well, that's, <laughs> that, dri- that, that drives me nuts, too, because as, as you know, as someone, like I said, who's yeah. been, been there, and I've been around, like, I've been around NBA players, yeah. like, played with them, played against them, as you have too, Bob, you know, like, you know, you can tell, right? But nobody can tell in fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade. I always yeah. say, like... Like, let them get through college first before we start talking about who's the NBA. Or, like, let them get to high school first before we start talking about D1. Because I always say high school changes kids, man. I knew a lot of phenoms in middle school. They get to high school, those distractions come into play. Hanging out with your friends more, girls, what X, Y, and Z. You see who's got the drive and who doesn't. Because when you're younger, a lot of times you're you're going off just being superior, like, athletically maybe. Or size or whatever. You hit puberty earlier. That stuff balances out at a certain point so then you kind of see that's why i always tell people pump your brakes like don't rush it people, oh so and so could be this what do you think mike what do you think i was like i go potentially we'll see like we will see why are you rushing it anyways enjoy the process of it. anyway you know i think that's probably me being a little older because i was young too everyone wants to yeah you think differently so i don't maybe i was thought the same way when i was like a teenager i don't know but I would say slow down, don't rush the process, enjoy the process, embrace like the the, the the grind as they say, it's a cliche term, but like don't be in such a rush to have him be have he or she be division one. So what so what is it that they they see? Are they being shown the process that's instant gratification? Are they, you know, is it is it the everybody gets a trophy? You know, are the do these things contribute to the need to have things done right away? Is it growth oriented or goal oriented? That's a great question. Um, I think there's a lot that goes into it. You know, like, I mean, is some of it like everybody gets a trophy? Maybe. Is some of it, I mean, I think some of it is people from from humble circumstances. Everybody wants a way out and they think sports is like the way out. And so if someone shows some talent, I think some of it is, you know, we all want to be around celebrity. So if it's not us when we're like kids, and even parents of kids. You like want to be attached to that. To, like, the really talented player, you know, in mm-hmm. middle school that's, like, you know, a fifth grader who's, like, six feet tall. Yeah. And it's, like, maybe he's going to wind up being a seven-footer. If he is a seven-footer, is he going to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time? <laughs> Most of them can't, you know. but Or maybe he's literally done growing and he's never going to be more than six feet tall. You know, yeah, but all everybody... those factors come into play that people, I don't think, always think about. Be like, well, okay, he's got a... A mustache and armpit hair at twelve. Yeah, is he going to be six six? Probably uh, not. Who yeah. knows? <laughs> right. You know, um, this is just with basketball. We haven't even touched another sport. Yeah, I mean, if I it's mean, tennis, it's... you know, or or baseball. I mean, like young young pitchers, right? Yeah. Oh man, he he's got he's he's got a gun. And then, right. And well, I think got... even pitching is more dangerous because then you get over. Like, it's one thing to be overworked in basketball. Mm-hmm. If you overwork your arm in, in baseball, like you wreck it. When, like, when I think back on Little League, and, and there's plenty of stuff now that, that people are like, oh, you know, that, that I, I don't think is better in this day and age than, you know, s- some stuff that I don't think is better in this day and age, like the way that everyone is promoted on Instagram and every, yeah. you know, but like there is progress too. Like our science behind sport has gotten better. Like no everybody's question. like, pitch count, all the, you know, the old timers hate it, but yeah. like, the it's, analytic part it, of it? it? Yeah, it's crucial, though, to saving arms. When I think back on Little League, I'm remembering back now. I haven't thought about this in probably 30 years. The time I didn't realize it, but I'm like, man, some of those travel teams, like our all-star teams that I played on, I feel like we had the same kid pitching every single game. We'd be playing three games a week. Okay. He'd pitch, like, a Monday and a Friday. And it's like the number of innings on his arm at age right. 12. Like, no wonder these kids didn't make it because, you know, one, some of them, they just matured way sooner and they yeah. weren't going to. But, like, some of the others, it's like by the time they were, you know, in their sophomore year of high school, they'd already thrown, like, you know, uh, you know, a 10-year major leaguer's worth of pitches because they were just being 
run yeah. out there every game. There was a one man rotation. Yeah, ex- that's exactly <laughs> it. Like yeah. you just made me think about that. Like, oh my god, like that was. Okay, so you're you're a three sport <laughs> athlete, right? Yeah, you're a three sport athlete. So, here's the question: Is basketball year round worth it? Or is the level of competition year-round worth it? it? Would probably be the question. I wanted to ask you. That's Gr- my great question, about. and I struggle with that as like a director and the coach for the pro- the program I now have. Like, I was I was a three sport guy, and so I encourage that because I think from a, a lot of standpoints, it helps with your overall athleticism because you're getting certain things in each sport. Provide. Yeah. I think there was a study. I don't have it in front of me, but like. More ACL tears come from single sport yeah. athletes than multi sport athletes, um, so that's another thing. Obviously, didn't know that when I was a kid, but um, but then it's like uh, when I'm a director, and then parents or players would be like, "Well, I can't make practice or I can't make games because I have lacrosse or whatever it is in the spring or whatever it is in the fall." You know, a conflict that it, it drives me nuts. So it's like it's a fine line because for me. I encourage multi-sport, but I'm all I'm, at the same time like commitment is huge to me. Like when you commit to something, you're all in, mm-hmm. and so that's been the toughest balance for me to be like, you know, to let it. Do I let it slide or do I? It's hard for me to do. And so is it workload then? Because if they're going to play something else, right, they're going to work just as hard in that next sport than they they had the previous sport, right? So if you're going from basketball to lacrosse, yeah. the workload is still tough. Yeah. Right, you've got your cuts, you've got your jumps, you've got your you know your, your shots or whatever. So, is the so when I was growing up, right, and you were out on the field all the time, you said, right, uh-huh. you know, just walk across the street, you're on the field. Yeah. When I played basketball growing up, we weren't on hardwood, we were out, we were on asphalt, yeah. right, all the time. Now, did you rest? Did you go home? You know, your, your mom says, go go to sleep, take a nap, right, because you're acting yeah. silly, right. So you go to sleep, you take a nap. But is the conditions that are the conditions that you grow up playing on, right? Were they, quote unquote, better then because you actually had to develop on a quote unquote rougher or more dangerous, I guess, surface. I mean, I was the same way too. Like I played outside all the time. Um, I think that like now people, it's like fr- not frowned upon, but this. I think that people, there's more availability to be inside, so people prefer that. Um, I think now is like being older and stuff, outside is not like conducive to the body, no give. Like my knees and lower back are probably shot from doing that stuff. But at the same time, I think it's it benefited me at the time. I'm sure it benefited you at the time. And like that might have been the only resource. Like you couldn't get into a high school. Now you can't. Everything's liability though too. Yeah. So unless you're at like a YMCA or a boys club, like you can't just go into your high school because you know they yeah. need, they need uh, insurance and stuff, yeah. which is wild to me. But I, I was thinking about this the other day. It's what you brought it up, but uh, I want to get into your point, your college and pro career. We kind of jumped ahead, anyways. But just what, one thought I had is that you know we were driving around my wife and I because we were trying to find baby formula. We couldn't. The formula shortage is awful, anyways. But like we drove <laughs> like multiple states. Really? Dozens of towns, yeah, because our, our youngest takes a very specific formula. He's, like, a really allergic. We, there's only really one formula that basically doesn't have all these different things in it. Um, we had to do a million doctor's appointments, go through, like, you know, like, ten formulas when he, before we found one that worked. And now, all of a sudden, this one's out everywhere. Um, but I was noticing from town to town we are driving to, and I'd already noticed this, but it was more glaring, like, driving through so many. Like, you go by basketball courts... And they're just empty. Yeah. So nobody plays pickup anymore. And when I was growing up, that was like where, where you went as a kid. You know, once you got to a certain level, okay, you go play against grown men. And, you know, it would challenge you a little bit. And, and I get it. There's great stuff about playing organized, structured competition. But, like, it's just crazy to me that you drive by and nobody plays on the courts. Even when I was in college, like in the early 2000s, you used to have, like, the college Division One players in the Boston area Harvard, BU, Northeastern, they play on outdoor courts against each other. Now everything is like contained. Like in the summer, it's like the college guys go from one college court to yeah. like inside. But it's crazy, and nobody plays pickup anymore, like at all outside. Well, I mean, I think you want controlled climate. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah, the wind, all that stuff plays yeah. a factor. It's yeah. smaller courts, so it's like if you're if you're in college, 
you're probably relatively big. The yeah. court shrinks real if you're playing on an outdoor court. Yeah. Right. So I get it to a degree. I think growing up, it was it was it was awesome. Yeah. Like for me, one of the one of the ways I used to get in shape was I would go down to this outdoor court near my house, and I would just play against like three younger kids. It'd be like three against one, and they would just make because you had three kids running at yeah. you, so help with my conditioning, help with all that stuff. So and you could always find like younger kids there. Yeah. So but, hey, you guys want to play? I was like maybe seventeen. They were like fourteen or something, thirteen. Mm. So that's how you get a workout in because, again, like I said, from a basketball standpoint, I didn't have, like, a trainer or, like, know what to do. Uh, but you I, wanted to go out there, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. D- they're in I, was, I was never in my house, put it yeah. that way. I was right. never in my house, and that's not – I mean, I'm 38, so I'm not that old, but, like, I sound wicked old when I was, like, when I was a kid. When I was a, <laughs> but it's honestly true. I was never in my house. We were either – doing some kind of sport or we were just active like climbing trees and yeah, doing something right. dangerous <laughs> um now it's just you know the everyone's you know video games and stuff have kind of i think been yeah. a technology is great but it can be detrimental too so no one had to tell you to go outside yeah never they have to tell me to come inside <laughs> exactly so so if you don't see anyone on the courts why is it? They don't want to be out there. Yeah, exactly. It, right? it makes me sad. I drive by all these empty courts, and I'm like, man, some of the highlights of me as a kid were, were like, it, once school break, summer, or even after school, like, once the weather got, like, okay, yeah. you could play until, you know, midnight, play basketball on the court with your friends. You know, that was a, that was a blast now. You know, but it's doing it. That was the toughest thing about COVID, right? Yeah. So one of the toughest things about COVID, I'm going to forget, you know, losing family members. And yeah. <laughs> But for the kids, you've got nowhere to go. You were stuck in the house. They took down the basketball courts, yeah, right? Yeah. You take down the hoops, yeah, right? Yeah, they were like you, chaining up the mats and you stuff. Cha- you chain. So and and you wonder why they're not outside. Now on the other side, you know, you, you complain about it, but uh, you know, you, the parents complain. I'm like, but you didn't send your kids outside anyway. So yeah, they actually took rims off so yes. and put yeah. pieces of yes. wood up there. The wood, yeah. And it just so happened to be in neighborhoods that I'm familiar with. Yeah, they didn't, I didn't do see... it in the suburbs. No, much, but, yeah. uh, no. They took it. They they took it down in some of the schools there where I'm at. Yeah. Yeah. So I I, I wanna I don't wanna be remiss because I really wanted to talk about it. we spent so much time on on uh, on AAU but like your college career and pro ball and I know time wise we we got a, a little bit of a but um. You know, you got to LaSalle 0304, I was I believe I looked up just yeah. to refresh myself. Yeah. You know, you were not you were a guy that basketball you weren't a basketball is life guy growing up. We talked about baseball was your passion, you played a bunch of sports. Correct. What was it like? Was it like a wake up call when you get to college or division one and a the Atlantic Ten isn't like a, a small major, low major. No, I get into season. arguments with people all the yeah. time when they try to call it a mid major. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a top eight conference yeah. in the country, top ten at the very least. Yeah. yeah. And, and so, what was that like when you first show up there and, and you get to college? I mean, for me, uh, like <laughs> this is a little bit, of, you know, being naive too. You know, I had a lot of success as a high school player, like um, from an individual standpoint. You know, average like my numbers, accolades, all that stuff. So I'm thinking, oh, this is uh, this will translate right over. This will be, you know, as a freshman, I'm going to average this and this. You know, yeah, it was it was it was definitely an adjustment. You know, uh, you see that. You know, everybody's good. Yeah. Everybody's athletic. Uh, and so, yeah, and then I think just the workload, too, you know, like when a, Division One level, you have mandatory summer school. So you, at, the, at that time, there was, you know, NCAA rules didn't allow the coaches to be with you, but now they've allowed, like, eight hours a week they're mm-hmm. allowed to work with you. But, like, you still had your, your like, 5, 6 a.m. lift. We had a 5, 6 a.m. lift or conditioning. You had your pickup. Then you go to class and all that stuff. So I'm going, this is, like, the most basketball I've probably ever played. And, like, it was, like, a rude awakening to a degree. You know what I mean? Um, And then, uh, you know, once you get into the season, you start doing your individuals. You do your preseason stuff. And then the length of practices are longer. You're doing three three practices a day with a lift, you know what I mean? And when I say practice, it could be an individual workout, which is supposed to be 45 minutes, but they have the clock covered and be in there yeah. for two hours. <laughs> uh, uh, then you have, you know, whatever. You get shots up, and then you have your team practice. So, you know, um, again, just a workload standpoint, it was it was an adjustment. Um, speed of the game, I always try to explain that to everybody. Like, at every level you grow, 
Elementary to middle school, speed's going to be a little bit different. Middle school to high school, high school mm-hmm. coach. That's the biggest thing is the speed. Uh, you know, you run like a transition drill uh, when you're in high school or something, it may take whatever, 12 seconds or something. You go to D- D1 level, it's like four seconds. It's just so fast. And um, I still preach this today to kids in terms of from a help defensive standpoint. <laughs> At that level, when you beat somebody, you have maybe one dribble, and then that lane is closed like yep. that. It's like you – people think you're just going to waltz to the rim and dunk on people and stuff. That lane closes so fast. More so in college than the NBA because the NBA, they spread you out more. College, it's more condensed, so it's just like – yeah, the, the the court shrinks, put it that way. Um, but it was good, you know. Like, there was a lot of the, – the problem with my, my team was like there was a lot of talent individually, but – didn't always gel well together. Like, I had two NBA guys on my team in college. Like, I guarded Steve Smith every day in yeah. college. I credit him to being the reason why I was, like, as good of a defender as I was. Uh, you know, he played with the 76ers for a little bit. Then he was overseas for, like, 12, 13 years. Like, absolute stud. Two-time A-10 player of the year. Yeah. Played with Gary Neal, who was in the NBA for, like, eight, nine years. Um, so, uh, the talent was there. It just didn't always... Uh, translate into uh, the collective your your freshman year I mean I never know what stats from when you go back to our time but yeah. but it looks like you started most of the games as a freshman it's, yeah I mean I was pretty much a four year starter uh, I started like maybe like six or seven games into my freshman year yeah um, again like I said at the beginning like from a skill standpoint I was probably a little bit behind um, but I was just like rugged tough and I kind of had the um embrace a different role whereas like in high school I'm the man you know scored like 25 points a game whatever it is uh but at that level like I already had they already had scores that were like sophomores juniors so it's like okay what, what do I have to do I have to defend and rebound and I was always a good rebounder like everywhere I ever played my rebounding numbers were pretty good um so like that was my role on that team and that was like, don't let the guy touch it. And I was undersized in the A-10. At six, I was playing against seven-footers, 6'10", 280, 290. I was, like, 6'8", 245. I would always try to bulk up in the offseason, get up to, like, 255, sometimes 260, and just shed it, uh, shed the weight once the season came. Um, but that was my role, and that's what I, I tried to embrace it. Um, and then, like, my freshman year, we had a different coach. Yeah, we, I was going to ask about I, w- when a coaching change happens and you're recruited by the previous guy, how does that go? When I mean, it was a weird situation. Like, I won't get into the reason for that, like the, the coaching change. But, uh, you know, I I had no idea. Like, again, I should have brought this up earlier, but I, there was no blueprint for me growing up. Like, I didn't know any Division One players. I didn't know how the recruiting process – I didn't know any of that stuff. So it was just like learning on the fly to me. Um and so when when that happened, there was a coaching change. It was like, oh, should I transfer? Should I not? You know, what should I do? Um, ended up sticking it out because the coach that came in had recruited me at another school. I had, I had said no to. <laughs> so, um, but I was like, okay, this will work out. Like he's familiar with me, he's seen me play. Now, what coach was this? John Janini. So Janini came in. He was at Maine. Okay. So and then okay, he came gotcha. into LaSalle because Billy Hahn had had left. Uh, he, he was forced to resign. Dr. John. Uh, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, and with that, there was, you're playing under another coach who didn't quote unquote recruit you. So yeah. there's friction there. You know, uh, you get reminded that, you know. You're, you know, not his recruit, so to speak. But, again, I still played, so I can't – like, I had my, my best friend on the team basically never played after his freshman year, and he was wow. really good, you know. But it was kind of like – I don't know. He got he got the short end on that one. So I always played. There was just – you know, we butted heads a little bit with our approach. Um, and, you know, I didn't – I thought I could have had a bigger role later on, like in my senior year especially. We had four freshmen starting me. Yeah. So I was like, okay, this is my year. It's going to be kind of more centered around me. I, I played with Steve Smith, like I said, two-time A-10 player of the year. So he's shooting the ball 20 times a game. Like, it just is what it is. Um, and that didn't happen, so that was kind of frustrating to me. And, f- and at that point, it was like I was trying to prolong my athletic career, 
so I was like thinking about going overseas, you know. Um, so I was like, I need to be put in a situation, you know, you, you, to get a contract, you got to have stats, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, um, my stats were nothing crazy from a, like a point standpoint. Um, but again, that wasn't my role. So, uh, was it ever hard to stay serious when Giannini with his voice? Yeah. I mean, that's, <laughs> a, that was like the funny thing we had, we could, uh, we could do um, imitations. And, uh, I have, I, I, I can do a pretty good one, but I won't, I won't do it. Sh- shout out to Dr. John. He's at Rowan right now. He's the AD. Yeah, he's trying to get them to Division One from Division Three. Yeah. Well, he won the national championship there when he yeah. was the coach there previously. Um, but yeah, he, he his voice is unique. He had the Chicago accent, you know, and he'd be like, "These cats, these cats are good." <laughs> so. You know, when you you finish up in college and you have, you don't end up getting to play the role that maybe you you had the ability to for a variety of reasons, including yep. we could have a whole episode on coaches when they inherit players and how much of a just there's so much that is that is. Well, there's a lot of things yeah. in there too, you know, but, and that's something I try to. Uh, what I preach to kids now is fit. Everything yeah. is fit, you know. Like everyone focuses on the level. Yeah. Whatever. You know, I say it's fit. So if you you could go, let's say you high major, but if you're only playing eight ten minutes a game, but you could go to maybe a mid major, yeah, and have a better bigger role, what's better? You know what I'm saying? Um, so that, that, that's where I'm at with that. Uh, but for me, um, it was like we had played in the summers. I don't know if you're familiar with John Harnett. Of course. Yeah. So John Harnett was a was like a fixture in Philly. Yeah. You know, because LaSalle's in North Philly. So uh, the six schools in the Philadelphia area, D1, you know, so then you have the Sixers, or then you have anybody who's in the NBA who's from Philly, Jersey, or even New York sometimes, would all play at LaSalle in the summers. It would rotate schools, but predominantly it was LaSalle because Harnett was a North uh, North Philly guy. And Aaron McKee and those guys were all, you know, right down the street. So we would have workouts every summer, and I was in college from freshman to senior year, and then I would go back my first – three summers I would go back for like two or three weeks just to just to work out Mm -hmm. because they were like the best runs on the east coast in my opinion I mean you know everybody anybody who was anybody in the tri-state area that played basketball at a high level was in there um and unfortunately John passed away so then there wasn't anybody to kind of pick up the slack in that regard um but those were insane times you go from like 8 a.m to like 3 in the afternoon and you do your skill stuff and you're like small sided, like three on three with stipulations, stipulated stuff. Yeah. And then in the afternoon, you play five fives. And it was funny because most of the NBA guys wouldn't show up till the fives. Of course, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but it was like insane competition. You got to win to stay on type of thing. If you lose, you might be sitting, you know, the whole the whole thing. You're sitting off for like an hour or whatever. But I mean, anybody who was anybody was in there. This is such a refreshing conversation, man. A central mass guy understands what Philly basketball is like. Yeah, it's no joke. I love, I love this. Well, yeah. from I Atlantic love this. City, so Philly yeah, is. I know, I know you're from Jersey. Yeah, so you you know how it is. I mean, that tri-state area in general is just like from a talent standpoint, uh, insane. Yeah. So and then you got kids who who play in those colleges from different states, but just like it's just a melting pot of talent. Yeah. Um, and that's when I knew I could play at like the pro level because I hold my own if not get the best of these do- these guys who are either in the NBA or overseas pros for a long time mm-hmm. and I'm going right at them like no problem so and, and in the summer you know when you're playing more pickup you can do more you don't got to look over your shoulder so then I'm able to kind of showcase m- what I can do a little bit more yeah our runs were uh, we either did it at McGonagall Hall okay because um, Sonny Hill was running a lot of his stuff. Oh, yeah, Sonny Hill was, was there and, when I was there, of course. And Harnett started uh, doing his runs. And uh, and up at Penn, we were up at Penn also getting a lot of runs in. So The Palestra is the best. I say it's <laughs> yeah. my favorite spot. Second oldest gym yeah. in the country behind Rose Arena at Fordham. Played there, too. You must have played there. Yeah. 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 Matthews um, is really old over at Northeastern, too. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so... How how did you how did 
how did you get your first like what was the process of, of getting overseas because there's people don't realize one high school players because everybody that's good ends up kind of being a big fish in a small pond yeah. unless you're on the sneaker scene and then college sort of same thing people don't realize well you get humbled when you yeah. go to college a lot of times most yeah. people how how few spots there are for how many players are coming out of each level how did you wind up overseas? Because like you said, you know, your numbers were like, hey, like solid, but not yeah. like, and nothing jumps off the page. And yeah. you, did you have like good film or, or good connections or what, you know? Well, I always like to say like a lot of the stuff I did w didn't show up yeah. in the stat sheet. But uh, <laughs> um, no, I kind of, like I try to explain to people, like I have a lot of kids that I coach or train now and like who I think have a shot collegiately and then, you know, hopefully after the fact. So I always try to, Tell them my journey was, like, not your traditional one. Uh, it was so after the season, I got I had, I had got an agent. I got introduced to an agent with a, a former teammate of mine, had the same guy um, who graduated a year ahead of me. He was out of North Carolina. I won't go into that, but that was a crapshoot. You know, like, I remember I... I sent them all my best games, you know, I had some, yeah. I had some good games, like tore up UMass, a few, like, yeah. I always brag, because I'm a mass guy, yep. I'm probably like eight and three lifetime against UMass, we <laughs> tore them up, uh, and I had one of my better games at, at the Mullen Center, so I, you know, I had some good games, I sent down and he was going to convert them to DVDs, because mm -hmm. they were on VHS, Right. this is back in the day, guys, Yeah. Uh, <laughs> 07 or whatever, uh, and, um, yeah, he like never never gave him back to me. I uh, never converted him. He did get me. A, he did get me over to Poland. So I, you know, that's yeah. the only job he really got me. Uh, and that was like eye opening. That was a whole thing where I learned where like they don't care what you did in the states. Yeah. They only care about what you do in their country. What part of Poland were you in? I was in Valbjic, okay. which was uh, like maybe like an hour and a half from uh, Warsaw or Wrocław, mm -hmm. as they say. Um, it's a city kind of like Worcester, actually, mm -hmm. like two hundred thousand, like old, old school. Yeah. Um, that was that was where I really learned like the politics of professional basketball. I learned like you know a good president, like well, you know all that kind of all the ins and outs. And I had an old head who taught me who was like thirty one or two at the time. He'd been played pro for like eight nine years at that time, and I was like twenty three coming out of college. Um, so he kind of schooled me on everything. Like, this is what you look for. This is what you do. Like, he made sure when I got over there, because I knew nothing. I didn't know how to use Skype, any of that stuff. Um, he he really helped me out. Tzell Archie, shout out to him. He's out in uh, Fresno, California. He played at uh, Pepperdine. But he, he was awesome. Um, but that was just a, a situation where, like... Dude, like, the, the, the politics of favoring your domestic players. Mm -hmm. And then, so I'm a rookie, so I was getting limited action, but then we play in cup games. I'd get, like, double-doubles in cup games. And then in league games, we wouldn't play as much, and they'd be like, well, cup games don't matter. I was like, what do you mean? I have bonuses in my contract for cup games, so how do they not matter? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so that was different. Um, but, again, a, a, a good education. Um, and then things didn't work out with that agent. You know, um, I had went to, uh, I'm trying to think of the order just, just in my head, but, uh, yeah, so I had an injury the next year. I tore ligaments yeah. in my ankle playing in an outdoor summer league in Northbridge. <laughs> um, came down on a kid's foot, like turned it completely over. My foot was like purple, whatever. And this was right before I had a, I was going to get a job in, uh, South America, I forget which country but I had to turn it down um, and so I missed like a year yeah and so you miss a year you know how it goes you miss a year you're you're screwed yeah unless you're like you know high major guy yeah. averaging whatever yeah. so um, I missed a year I ended up getting like a regular job with uh, some friends not well, it's like acquaintances well my good friend got me the job and then I worked with some younger kids who were from the same town as me which is funny we worked for a moving company, moving libraries and books and all that stuff. And I remember these guys used to bust my balls all the time, being like, yeah, you know, you ain't, you ain't going to go back over, like, shitting on me. So I was like, okay, we'll see. So the whole time I'm working, like, whatever, eight to whatever, like, eight, ten-hour days, and then I'd train, I'd lift, and then I'd go shoot at night. I played in some men's leagues and whatever. But I was like, I'm getting back over there. Uh, 
And so I went to a, a couple of showcases, summer leagues. I went to one in New York City at Fordham. Uh, and I ended up, it was in front of a bunch of scouts, international scouts and coaches and stuff, and I got signed from there. So that was one. Uh, that's how I got over to Denmark. It was an American coach, Ken Webb, you know him? Yep. Sure do. Yeah, so he was a Fairleigh Dickinson guy. He's from mm -hmm. Jersey. Mm -hmm. uh, he gave me the, he really helped me, you know, after missing a year. Yeah. Uh, my first year out, it wasn't like, I had a, like a ton of film. Like I said, I had some good games, but it wasn't a huge body of work. Um, and he kind of vouched for me. He liked my, he liked how I played. He always said I had a great motor. Um, and so he kind of, talk the the team into be because I missed a year so he's like trying to be like well he went he went back to school da, 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 you know finessed him a little yeah. bit <laughs> uh, he went to you know so um, and then ended up working out I played for him over there I had a good season over there we won the bronze medal in Denmark statistically I was solid average a double double made you know all star game all that stuff and then it was from there it was just the rest of the career and for me you know again didn't know anybody leading into it. Like, from high school, yeah. obviously I met people, but, like, some people were very familiar or very comfortable with playing in one league, and it's comfortable. They're all about comfort. They know yeah. they're going to get a job each year. Some people like to chase the level. Yeah. They want to play at the highest level. That was kind of how I was because I'm just, like, I consider myself ultra competitive, so I was like, I want to, like, I always tried to, from one level, more entry level, next level, next level, next level, so... Just kind of tried to work my way up the chain. Made it to the Euro Cup. So, like I said, international competition. It's one of the highest levels in Europe. Um, and uh, and then I finished up in Asia, which was in Japan, which was a whole different animal. Going from Europe to there, that's just night and day from not just basketball, but just everything. Which league in Japan? So I was in the, I was in the BJ League. The this BJ. was before they broke off into, like, yeah, like JBL. And J well, no, this was, JBL was before me. Okay. But this was before they did. They switched it like the year after I was there, uh, in terms of how they 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 listed it. But um, I played two years there, and it was it was cool. Like once you. The good thing about Asia, about Japan, and and South Korea, and you know, typically China too, but is that you get paid. Like well, yeah, that's the biggest thing. It's always that, on time because yeah. the economy doesn't affect them like it affected Europe. Yeah. Um, so, like, their mo money was on time all the time. I was on some teams. I don't know how you were when you played, but, you know, sometimes it'd be like a week. They'd be like, oh, in a week, in a week, money would come, money would come, and sometimes it was a little slower. I played in one team who had a huge budget, the team I played in the Euro Cup with. We had to, uh, we had to sit out of practice for, like, we had to basically protest to get our, <laughs> our paycheck. And we had the biggest budget in the country yeah. for the domestic league. Yeah. Uh, and we basically, like, sat out until they gave it to us. Um, yeah, we went three months without getting paid in Spain wow. because we were losing games. Yeah. So it was always, you know, because you signed two contracts. You signed your image contract and you signed your, the contract with the team. Yep. And, uh, you know, we thought about, we thought about sitting out. So that check came in. <laughs> it's like, okay, we're back. So you, like you said, you sit out of practice. Yep. And, uh, you know, from a practice, you start thinking about sitting out games. But if you sit out games, then you're probably screwed because you're not going to get your money anyway. Yeah, well, what happens is is they basically, like, they give you a little bit mm -hmm. just to keep you, yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. And then they do it again. And then they do it again. It's just, and they have it. But a lot of, you know, not to put down, uh, you know, the level of basketball is really good. But, like, how they, how they, do business isn't you yeah. know what I mean so um, some of those countries they they're shady with how they do things you know what I mean and and you know I'm sure you've experienced it too where sometimes the league like the level isn't even necessarily a high level but they have money because of their owners whoever their sponsors are so like like for example maybe just just throwing it out there top league in like maybe Italy let's yeah. say they have three leagues yeah maybe four I think now but so Serie A, their yeah. highest level, you might have a team that has less money than a third division team. So some guys will go over there, they'll play in the third division, they don't care about the level, they just care they're going to make more money. Yeah, they find a team that they can... They're comfortable yeah. with, you know, they don't, they don't, there's not as much pressure. 
they don't have to produce as much. The team doesn't care if they move up or go down, you know, relegation. or And they might get paid X amount more than if they were in the higher league. And some guys are cool with that. Like, I, just, I was never really cool with that. Yeah. I just – probably st- stupid. <laughs> Uh, but my mindset was always just like I want to see if I can get to the highest level, and, and, and honestly, part of that is agents. Like I had, I had like three, four. I had signed with a fourth agent right before I had to retire. And that, uh, but I had some good ones. I had a few good ones, and I had a few bad ones. The ones that are good, they'll push for you, even in a market that you're not from, like they're not familiar with, or it's like you know it might be tough to navigate. Some of them, they won't even try. That's what would drive me nuts. You know, I'd be like, I always want to play in this country. Mm-hmm. They wouldn't even mm-hmm. attempt to try to push yeah. me in that country. You know, so. Now, I want to ask you, because we, we're getting up, we got about nine minutes left that we can sure. use in here, but I want to ask you about the end of your career. Because yep. that, I know, it was not planned. No. Uh, you know, and, and what would you be willing to share with us about, about how that ended? That was, a, that was a game changer, man. That was like a whole life changer. Um, you know, impacts me now. So, long story short, I was home in the summer, still training. I used to train at uh, um, Exceed Sports Performance and Fitness in Westboro. Okay. Uh, yeah. These guys are unbelievable. Shout out to those guys. Um, and uh, I had started feeling, I wasn't feeling myself, whatever. So, I ended up, they were like, well, maybe you have Lyme disease, which is r- random, but yeah. went in and got some tests. I said, oh, my chest feels a little weird, so they did some tests, and, you know, long story short, they ended up finding out I had a aortic aneurysm, which is like, you know, the thing that pumps blood through, from your heart to the rest of your body. So mine, I guess, is like way bigger than the average, per- like normal. Um, so it was one of those things where I had saw a couple specialists move me to another, went to Brigham and Women's in Boston, they have like, mm-hmm. you know, and so... The doctor was basically like, that's it. You know, you wow. risk the chance of it rupturing and di- you, you, you die. Uh, so there's no no more career, basically. That was that was tough to swallow because I had three or four offers to go back over to Japan. I was going to go back over to Japan. I had to turn them down. That aside, that's one thing. But just, like, now it's it changed my whole life. Like, uh, I'm not supposed to... I have to be way more conservative in just what I do from a... St- strenuous standpoint lifting i always been like lifted weights yeah. my whole life like I'm, I'm much smaller now than i used to be because i can't lift as heavy you know because the more you strain the, the the more the blood flow goes through and makes the walls of your aorta thinner think of it like a balloon the more you blow it up the thinner the walls get mm-hmm. same kind of concept so it's just been a, it's just been I have to constantly get it checked yearly I have to get mris yearly to make sure it hasn't grown and it's just I'm, I'm, I deal with it now, but at the time it was like a depressing time, you know, for like a year. It was, uh, it was, it was rough, and I didn't know what I was gonna do. I was one of those guys that didn't really, you know, to a fault. I wasn't setting myself up for after my career. I was just focused on my career. I was just, I didn't wasn't like, oh well, you know, I'll get into this when I, when I when I'm finished. I thought I'd play another three, two, three years maybe. Uh, I would have been 35. I had to retire at 32. So, um, yeah, it's just, and then from there, it's just been kind of dealing with it since, like I said, I have to be more conservative. People are always like, do you play in any leagues anymore? Do you do that? I don't even play anymore, really. I just train, so I'm like yeah. a tr- trainer too. So I'll mess around with the guys I train one on one or just some, but I don't get up and down like that yeah, anymore right. because. I don't trust myself, one, because all it takes is someone to start chirping me. (laughs) And then I have to strain a little bit more than I should, and I run that risk. Like, if I could just go out there, shoot threes, and just jog back, I could probably do it, but I don't don't trust myself to do that. Uh, And then it's just, like I said, just a a conservative approach for me, which is hard when you're an athlete your whole life, and you go 100 miles an hour at all times. And so... uh, how long, cause so we're like six years out of when that happened in yep. Matt's career. Yeah. How long, maybe maybe you're someone that you were never, it was never like living a little scared in the back of your head, but or maybe you're someone that always, how long do you think it took before you weren't like constantly like, oh man, some like. Well man, I still, back, I still feel like that to a degree. Like I'll be like, 
if I do something where I have to, I might feel like a little tightness or something, yeah. and I'll just be like, okay. Well, I, I constantly wear like a, a thing so I see what my heart rate's at, and um, it, you know, it went through a period of time when I was like, it's like a ticking time bomb. Like, well, all it takes is for me. What if I ever, you know, got into it with somebody and I had to like be real aggressive, yeah. you know, you know, that type of stuff. You run those little things in your head. Because yeah. I can control if I'm going to play basketball yeah. or not. Mm-hmm. But, like, if I have to get into it with somebody yeah, you or... you can't control because you're a big guy. Or whatever. Like some, or something or happens out of my control where I can't fire. Play. You have to get out of the house. Yeah, you know. Like, yeah. Um, but at this point, it's like, it's just, it's there. And I know it's there. And I just have to kind of deal with it. It's It sucks. And I get periods of time where it's like I wish I was still playing you know because you know when you're over there it's something different every day you come back home it's like you can get into a little bit of a routine it's not as exciting um it's a good not exciting (laughs) yeah it's a good yeah well it's more uh you know familiar yeah um yeah but you know it's the same thing day in and day out for the most part uh so that gets, but at the same time, like I said, it is what it is. I can't, I can't change it. I can just monitor it. And wow. I tried to get him to do like an open heart or like to yeah. have surgery, because like Jeff Green had the same thing. Okay. You know, um, but he plays for the he, in the NBA. You get the best doctors go in there. Right. You know, so it's a little different animal. Um, I asked him. I was like, "Well, can we do that?" And he was like, "Well, it's not." Basically, for me, it's, it's too small to do surgery in their mind in his mind and then too big to play so it's like i'm kind of stuck in like just a monitoring standpoint wow and and for six years i've monitored it hasn't grown thankfully um but you know you never know well i guess the last question uh because of time it's just you know you i know you've kind of now you're you're giving back to the next generation you also there's several kids from the north borough south borough Marlboro yep. area that either have gone on to play Division One or are playing Division One, and and plenty of kids that are playing two Division Two, II, Division Three, which yep. is call you make it to college basketball. You're doing an amazing job no matter what division. Absolutely, but you've got like Chris Doherty. You've got some other kids that uh, you know um, that you've worked with, and, and just what's it like to give back to kids from your community or those communities in that area that aren't necessarily basketball hotbeds, and, yeah. and you know when you were growing up, you weren't really exposed to that kind of to, to like. The process of making it in basketball. I mean, it's I, I love it. You know, I mean, I have I've been fortunate. Once I got once I got done playing, I got kind of right into coaching, which is another thing. I never really foresaw myself as a coach. It's more the training aspect is yeah. really the wheelhouse. The coaching is the competition. Yeah. So I get this, you know, a little nuts. I saw some of your other podcasts where you're like the coaches are like this. I might be guilty of being like that a little bit. Um, but no, I, I, I love it. Uh, I love being able to try to help, help the kids out from my experiences. And, you know, I always say, I want to make you better than me and I'll, I'll never concede that they'll ever be better than me, <laughs> but my goal is to prepare them to try to be better than me. Um, cause right now they, they can't beat me. Um, but yeah, no, I got a, a handful of kids with, uh, actually, so from Northwell alone, you got AJ Bruder. Who played a pen? He'll be a Big Five Hall of yeah. Famer. He had a, like yeah. almost two thousand. Wonderful points. career. Dude. He was a stud. Wow. Uh, he's a Northboro kid. Uh, you got Alex Caravan, who originally was from Southboro, moved to Northboro. He's at UConn right now. Yeah. Four star, five star kid, like absolute stud. Um, Chris Doherty, obviously Marlboro. Zach August was from Marlboro. He's yeah. over in the Euro Cup. Um, you know, I don't want to leave anybody out, but there's been plenty of, you know, plenty of players. Those kids just stand out because of the most recent. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, you got a bunch of kids, D3 and D2 along the way. You know, uh, one of my players, Pat Freeman's at Keene State right now. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, just actually Reed, Reed Bailey, when he moved to, uh, from Ohio, he was in Westboro first. Yeah. Then he moved up to Harvard. So we might claim him as yeah. a borough kid, and he's at Davidson this year. <laughs> uh, even though Westboro was the rival when we were growing up. Uh, Northboro versus Westboro was our school rival, but we hated Marlboro more. Um, no, Reed Bailey. Excuse, excuse me for interrupting. Sure. Reed Bailey is the son of my teammate at Pitt, Nate Bailey. Really? So I, I know his know parents, that. Nate and Linda Bailey. So shout out to Nate and Linda. Yep. Reed, what's up? Great, great family. You know, yeah. super athletic. Yeah. Hail to Pitt. They're all, they're all, uh, they're all D1 athletes. Yeah. You know, sisters were volleyball. D1 
dad and the two two sons are yeah. D one basketball, and the mother I, I believe was D one volleyball. So, well, Mike, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today for our tenth episode. Bobby, once again, thank you. Appreciate you uh, for coming. Appreciate it. It's my pleasure, guys. Thanks, thanks so for having for, me. For everything you do for for doing things the right way too in AAU. I appreciate that. I try my best.